researchers, who are bilinguists uh, and uh, digital humanists, uh, and librarians, I mean, library, other resources that hold data that, on the face of it, is not usually uh, used in linguistic research. In, in linguistic research, but um, I want to argue um, with this uh, with this presentation that it's very useful to think in those terms for both parties. Uh, so I want to present uh, an open access, an open corpus of emergent Hebrew. Uh, emergent Hebrew, uh, think back to the uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, when Hebrew, the language we speak today, uh, first revived, or was beginning to be revived. Um, and it's a very interesting question that we don't know uh, the answer is to it. We cannot describe it, but a very interesting question. What was the process of this emergence? How did the language uh, evolve, consolidate? What was the initial state? What languages did people know? How did that knowledge influence Hebrew as we know it today? Uh, what were the effects of language contact? Again, people uh, who first start, started using Hebrew and speaking it to their children or to people around them, they knew multiple languages, um, uh, and they themselves were not native speakers. How did the grammar consolidate um, in those, under those circumstances? And, and how from, and at what point was there Hebrew? <laughs> was there modern Hebrew? Uh, and how did that variety continue to change? maybe normally, more in the ordinary way in which languages change all the time. So the emergence of modern Hebrew was the, was the um, topic and the focus of a research group that operated at the Hebrew University up until, for three years, up until 2016. Uh, and I was a postdoc on that project. Uh, and in that capacity, um, I came to, uh, to ask the questions about ask questions about what resources are available for doing this kind of linguistic research. So emerging modern Hebrew, as we'll call it, uh, is, it does not exist. It's a historical language. Uh, and furthermore, it's a historical language without records of recorded speech. We don't actually know how people spoke at that time. There are no records. You know, even going back to the radio, the initial, you know, in the 30s, that's kind of too late for, for us. Time period we're interested in here it kind of gives you a snapshot of, of some landmarks in the evolution in the revival of modern Hebrew from from when you know the first schools started to be put into place in kindergartens um, and there was became a generation of first a first generation of people who used Hebrew as their primary uh, language um, and from the 20s and on we can state the resource research has, uh, has identified. Uh, that period, in particular yeah, Resha's work, has identified the 20s as a, a, a time in, in history in which there was a stable variety with a grammar uh, that could be identified as Hebrew as such. Uh, so we're interested in kind of the period, in the early 20th century, um, what was the language like before then, and what was the process of consolidation? So to, to do this, uh, one needs a corpus. One needs a, a corpus of examples um, of the relevant time period, um, which um, if you really want to answer any kind of question, and not just the one maybe you're thinking about today, but any kind of linguistic question, you need it to be open access. You need access to the, to, to the text, the running text in its entirety. Um, it's good that it would have various genres, uh, that were written by multiple people uh, with multiple backgrounds, maybe in multiple places. Um, and in order to get a, uh, some kind of quantitative measure of how grammatical, how grammaticalization worked, what were the steps, we need it to be, of course, in digital form. Um, and some level of annotation, linguistic annotation, is very good. So if you, if you want to kind of rise above just studying one word or a set of words, but you want to focus maybe on the entire verb words, right? The, uh, an entire um, grammatical category. Uh, and of course, this is historically one of the development over time, so you need some level of markup, uh, in particular, you know, date, metadata. Uh, in order to do the mo more locational uh, questions, uh, you need, of course, place um, and other other kinds of metadata that you can start thinking about that are relevant to answer these, answering these kinds of questions. 
And of course, you need uh, a search platform that will allow you to search for, say, you know, all the nouns in the plural uh, which had uh, a definite article ha in front of them. <laughs> so you want to be able to, to, to go into that resolution. You want to search for those things, and you want to, of course, be able to save your results in order to further um, query them. So there are <coughs> corpora, very good corpora out there, um, and these have been mentioned already in various talks, but uh, I'll mention in particular uh, the project in Yehuda, uh, the Historical Jewish Press, the Magalim, the Historical Dictionary Project of the Academy of the Hebrew Language, and Google Books. These are kind of the major sources of large corpora of the, of the time. In terms of size, these are small. This is very big. <laughs> In terms of quality, though, these are the best. These are better. So Google Books is very, very large. Uh, there's a corp, there's, there's scanned, uh, you know, um, versions of many books in Hebrew, but uh, not much research has built, linguistic research has been based on that resource. We don't know what went into that. It's not really open access. It's given to you only in um, you know, bits. Kind of. so you don't have really access to the whole thing. These, these three have been the main, major um, basis for linguistic research on emergent modern paper. However, um, and Google Books is kind of secondary. However, none of these, I want to argue, um, give us the, you know, the full set of desiderata uh, that, I, that I was mentioning before. And let me kind of um, um, maybe quickly say that, you know, Project Ben Yehuda doesn't come with dates, for example. You cannot base a historical linguistic search on it because you don't know when text came from. Um, Magalim is, is, it has a very, very nice interface, but it's there, it's a proprietary interface, and you don't have access to all the text, therefore you, you don't have access to, you know, you cannot uh, say how, how relatively frequent a form, a linguistic form was at a particular time period. You don't, um, you cannot ask all the questions that you would like to ask, although in terms of annotation and linguistic quality of the data, it's the best. Uh, um, and it has been manually kind of um, both transcribed and uh, analyzed. And if it were open, it would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not at this point. And the Hebrew uh, Jewish, the J Press, the historical uh, j um, journalism site, that's excellent. And but it comes with the pro with the problem of having been digitized uh, automatically uh, with uh, OCR technology, and it's good for some things. So because it's so so big, there have been studies, you know, tracking particular words or tracking particular grammatical constructions, and because it's so big, you do get some data. So, you know, you can treat it as kind of sampling, but it doesn't give you the full, uh, what, the full um, uh, ability to ask any questions you want, and of course it's available only through a dedicated interface with certain um, questions you can ask, um, not including, for, for example, a grammatical category, which is kind of a baseline for any generalization study that aims for generalization of, about the language. So we wanted to uh, try and put together a resource that would be fully open access, that would have various genres uh, in it, and that would be you know, digitized in the, in the good way. Um, and uh, we thought that it would be, to, to build it in such a way that it would be useful for, not just for linguists, but for anybody researching this, this period. Um, and, uh, and conversely, to, to make use of resources that already exist and that we need, for example, dates. Uh, the nature of the text, so it's all open access, and so when we went to, to think about resources for you know, texts of the period that are not literary and represent more like what you, know, you and I would have said had we lived in that time, uh, we found the ephemera collection at the National Library of Israel to be excellent. Uh, of course, it's both, both open, uh, it's fully accessible, you know, the images are fully accessible. Uh, it's, it's language that appeared in ad, in, you know, street ads and, and you know, uh, various ephemeral fleeting, documents fleeting moments in time. Events that happened, gatherings uh, that were announced, uh, and uh, texts that were written by you know, 
anybody, and we're not copy edited, right? As you can see here, they contain mistakes. Um, uh, we'll look at the one on the, on the right in somewhat more detail later, but this gives you a, a, like a, a feeling for what the actual texts are like. So unlike, say, the historical uh, dictionary at the Academy of the Hebrew Language, which only contains literature that was written by you know, professional writers and talented individuals that maybe had also ideology going into, the, into their writing or you know, poetic uh, purposes, this, is, this represents uh, maybe what might uh, be closest to the natural use of the language of the period, which is what we want. Absent recordings. Um, so, again, these are kind of announcements and gatherings, and, you know, political events, uh, just random, um, random, yeah, kind of unimportant things, which are very important in terms of their language. Um, and what we can see is that uh, it's it's you know a genuine good corpus of emergent modern Hebrew because it contains these phenomena that have been reported in the literature and the linguistic literature as reflecting the unstable language of the time. So for example, in the ad we saw before, there was this example here, which is, you know, ungrammatical Hebrew. It's not good Hebrew, it's not good, you know, even kind of classical Hebrew, because in Hebrew you want, you know, ha to be in both places. You can't just have a definite marker on one, one item. You have to both say that it's that's how you would say it. In early modern Hebrew, it's known that these things that are called agreement uh, were much less in force. Uh, and people didn't quite know how to say these things. Uh, and we have it fossilized here in the written record. And uh, it's possible to see uh, other phenomena that are like this. Showing that even these you know, little tiny things, they're useful because they contain things that really um, uh, researchers have found to, um, to be characteristics of the language at the time. And again, after the 20s, these things kind of disappear and everybody starts speaking the same way. This is an overview of what we have in the corpus right now. Um, we have street ads from the National Library of Israel, the Tremor Collection, as well as municipal posters. Those are one is kind of more of the, the street ad, the ad, the ads that you saw before, and the other one was more of like an announcement from the Tikva. Um, these are um, of the relevant time period. They're not large, but they're useful. The large part comes from the Project Ben Yehuda, which we saw at the beginning, which is uh, you know the, the open access initiative of putting the uh, you know, treasures of Hebrew literature online but we have to have dates for it. So what we did was take that, uh, which was graciously given to us um, by Asaf Baltov, the, the leader of Project Ben Yehuda, and we tried, and we wanted to add dates to this collection and to put it together with the entire, to get, put it inside and treat it as part of the, of the linguistic corpus. Project Ben Yehuda was already transcribed. These ads were not. So this is the flow of what we did to a document. We transcribed it, looking at the image and transforming it manually into um, digital text. We marked it up, added um, dates, place information uh, to it. We added linguistic annotations to it um, automatically, in a way that I'll describe in a minute. And we put everything inside the database into a program, also open access, that allows the, the, the required search and save capabilities that we wanted uh, at the outset. Uh, so we treat uh, you know, the, the transcribe, then we look at the document as a whole, give it some uh, its, its metadata. We do all this using TEI in the hope, again, of creating a resource that is useful not just for linguists. And then we do do some linguistic stuff with it. We do do the, the, the annotation. It's diverse in terms of genre, uh, and different in that sense, say, from Project Ben Yehuda and from the Magdalene Corpus, because it contains the ephemera, which we found to be very valuable and interesting. Uh, and, it's not just, and it's not journalism, so it adds you know, a new component to the existing resources. And it uses TEI, uh, so it's not just on my computer, uh, and it's not usable, it doesn't have 
have my encoding, my great, smartest encoding schema, right? It's something that everybody can use. Um, we have document structure, some, some named entities, uh, date normalization, this is an important feature, you'll see in a minute, uh, metadata for all of any of the project documents, uh, the you know, a fifth of them we did manually, so we looked at, we tried to match, oh, you know, this piece of uh, literature was written in 1919, etc. And the rest we did based on author lifespan estimation in collaboration with the NLI again. So using information in the catalog, since the Benyuda project tells you who wrote it, but not when, so you can look at who wrote it, look into the catalog to see the lifespan of the individual, and then estimate. Uh, do like kind of, you know, the midpoint, the average, say, of the, when the person lived, and give that as an estimate. And we do know to distinguish between the things we actually researched and have a date for and the estimations. And the estimations are also useful. Again, so if you want to know if something is from the 16th century or from the 19th century, you'll get, you know, even more, more information for that. And we added more flawed annotations. So we take something like this, and using a crowdsourcing task, again with, in cooperation with the National Library of Israel, with Sinai, uh, and with uh, Maya Mago, who was at the time uh, the, in charge of their crowdsourcing platform, we had a task which, which involved volunteers that looked at these small little ads and transcribed them for us, just because they were interested. Uh, we also did a little competition to make it more interesting. Uh, you know, people got prizes if they found interesting linguistic phenomena in the data. And, you know, they were language geeks, and so they enjoyed this. And the, as a result, we have the transcription of, um, of the text. We also looked at them and did some, some small amount of editing later. And then we put it into TEI, both the header, so both the kind of metadata. Um, we have a link to the NLI catalog using uh, what I hope is the stable <laughs> identifier of the document. And so this allows a, a translation and, and to get immediately the URL that would allow you to see actually the image on the NLI website. We don't download anything. We don't think we should hold copies of any, everything. This is part of using everybody's resources together. And we do some name, um, name, uh, date norm normalization, which you can see here. This would be the text itself, the body of the ad. It's, it's kind of basic, but it you know, shows you what the, where the header is, what the closer is, where there's a signature. Uh, where's there, when, where the, the date is, and we do some normalization. So the ad itself only had a Dao Bet something, you know, the Hebrew calendar um, uh, date, and here we, we normalize it to the best of our ability to make that mar March 1919. Morphological annotations. There are no morphological annotators automatic for historical Hebrew, not, definitely not for this variety, because there are no corpora to, to train on. So we did what's uh, considered uh, uh, standard practice in historical NLP, and we used the tools for modern Hebrew on the historical <laughs> variety uh, as a first step. Also, we want to ask how close is modern Hebrew to that language? Is it like, is it like running a, an English tag around the data? Well, no. So the languages are close. Um, uh, and through this process, we get a first pass annotation of, of the data, which we can now, you know, work on fixing. And we don't need to start from, from scratch. So you might wonder, how close are the dialects? Uh, this, is, this is a summary of uh, a comparison on a small set, a gold set, uh, trying to see how good are the annotations. Um, and if you can look first at the, well, at the bottom, I guess. Um, Overall, accuracy is very good if all you're interested in is the part of speech, that's POS, so just knowing it, whether it's a verb, it's a noun, it's an adjective, does it pretty well um, across all genres. If you're only interested in the lemma, that's also pretty good. But you can see with all features, which contains things like tense, was it past tense or, no, or present tense, uh, was, what, what's, the, what's the number, is it plural or singular, um, uh, so linguistic features like that, if you take those into consideration, you see a, a big, big drop. The drop is less in the ephemera collection, which is, you know, uh, it's smaller, so maybe we need a, a larger sample, but it also tells you something, that the way people wrote at the time was different from the authors 
way of writing in the literary venue, the project, and that, and that it was closer, to some extent, to modern Hebrew. So maybe in their writing, people use more biblical forms than in their speech, which we think the ephemera is trying to approximate, that is approximating better. This shows you uh, the importance of adding new genres uh, and not just looking at, at literature, which we know, you know, some people had ideology of speaking like the Bible at, at, at some, at least in certain periods of the revival of Hebrew. So it's a decreased accuracy with respect to what these tools do on modern Hebrew, but it's a start. It's a start, and it's interesting, and it shows you something linguistically interesting about the different uh, varieties. So what are the challenges? You know, I mentioned some of them. Um, you know, uh, words are spelled differently. There are no imot kriak in the data. That makes huge confusion, like schuyot, for example, nobody would spell it this way. The modern tiger doesn't know what to do with this. Well, it knows. It just assigns it a different thing altogether, um, you know, etc. Shod, for example, all these things com you know, compound and confuse the tools. Um, and also lexical var variation. Like, we don't use ken amunot today. We would say it, you know, totally differently. No. Um, so things, so it's both lexical yeah. and morphological and, and in terms of just the writing, the orthography is problematic. Um, but anyway, this, this research allows us to see where, where are the points of confusion and how you might want to, what things you might want to fix in order to get to train a good or a better uh, NLP tagger for the historical variety. So we have all this analysis done, and then we want to search it and save it, uh, and we use an open source platform to do so, uh, which uh, works with Hebrew, with right to left, uh, and contains a lot of things. We use in particular Ennis, which is uh, both a database and a query system, which gives you results as a concordance, which is basic format, so something like this. You search for something and it'll highlight the word you're interested in and give you some context and show you all the features, the linguistic features of the word and its surroundings. Plus, of course, being able to ask about metadata. So again, if you're interested in just all the future forms of Binyan Hitfael in 1930 to 1932, you can ask that question and get it get a result back. Um, you can use regular expressions. Um, you can <coughs> and you can link to the documents. Um, so this this is kind of the recorded view. Uh, you can and, and the search is over here. You can share your queries. I can share my corpus anybody that's interested in it, and you can run exactly the same query on your computer and get what I saw as results. And, you know, think about whether I did a good, uh, whether I answered my questions well or not. So this is something that definitely cannot be done with any of the existing tools. And just quickly, so we call this the Jerusalem Corpus of Emergent Modern Hebrew, so it's a gem for research, right? Uh, for linguistic research, it's my interest, and I just want to show you. So both about grammar, um, on all levels, uh, about sociolinguistics, taking in, into account location information and other things that currently uh, are just in the developmental stage. But you can think that, for example, if you add metadata about what were the native languages of the author of your text, you can search, you will, you would be able to search for uh, and get information about how people that spoke Russian say, what was their verbal system like? And what were people that spoke both Russian and Yiddish? What was their, you know, linguistic ability in Hebrew, like, can you see any generalizations like that? This is where we want, want to go. So this is uh, just in order to give you some taste for it in the morphology, for example, you can see, you can plot, get information about the verbal templates. Uh, with By decades, and see that the productivity of the templates has changed. This is something that Wolotsky has told us about modern Hebrew, but how did we get to this point? You can see it's a gradual change where, uh, say, Hitpa'el becomes more productive, Pi'el becomes more productive, and Pa'al, for example, is in a decline. Um, so you can get information like this just because you have open access to the data. You can uh, further annotate certain phenomena, so I'm interested in Yesh, yesh, yesh latzet, yesh l'sayam in the moshav. So I'm interested in that kind of modal meaning of the existential, and 
I know that at some point I could have said yes, Lee, that's it, but we don't do that anymore. Anyway, so I'm interested in that, and I can plot it on a timeline and see that you know one construction decreased and the other kind of stayed. Uh, and I can look at the examples, of course, that support this. And this is just to give you a, an idea of what locales this data comes from. The, the posters are split between the Tanya, yeah. Haifa, and Dikva, which, you know, some, some of these are cities, some of them are more agricultural communities, work more agricultural, bigger, smaller. You know, you can ask various questions about the language that came specifically from people in that particular place. Um, the street ads are more you know, biased towards so to sum up, this, this corpus is a step towards a better quantitatively grounded understanding of how part the language we speak today developed. Um, and insisting on this open access idea has enabled the collaborative effort, say with the, with the National Library, uh, for what is uh, a ra rapid development of a corpus. So if you think about the historical dictionary project, that has been going on for 40, 50 years, right? Specifically on this time period. And the Ben Yehuda project, which is wonderful, right? And it's in here, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of what we're using, but that's been going on for maybe 20 years all, already. And we, we, we do need a more, um, I mean, I think that if we join forces, we can get better resources for all of us. Um, and, and I'll stop here. This is some directions that we want to take this, and I already think of those.